Hello, I'm Locke Meredith, and I'd like to invite you to join me on The Next Legal Lines, where we're pleased to have as our guest Sharon Broom. She is Senate President Pro Tem for the Louisiana Senate. Sharon's going to talk to us about the fiscal session that the legislature just had, but she's also going to talk about several bills that became law. Those are a bill dealing with foreclosure, a bill dealing with a mental health court, and also a bill dealing with human trafficking. So join us on The Next Legal Lines with State Senator Sharon Broom. Hello, I'm Locke Meredith, and I'd like to thank you on behalf of myself, Sean Fagan, and Corey Ogeron, and our entire staff for letting us come into your homes for the last 10 years via Legal Lines. We hope that you've come to a greater understanding of how the law works and how the government works for you. So from all of us, thank you. Hello, welcome to Legal Lines. I'm Locke Meredith. I'm very pleased to have on the show today Sharon Broom. She is Senate President Pro Tem for the Senate of Louisiana. Sharon, it's great to have you so back. So great again. to be here. Uh, Good to be I here. I can't believe it's been so long. I, I don't know. know what happened. I dropped the ball. But <laughs> let's let's dive in just so, because it has been a while. Just kind of tell the folks about yourself. You know, education, mm -hmm. kind of employment history, public service, that stuff. Let's start with education. Well, my background, uh, contrary to a lot of legislators lock. Uh, I'm not an attorney. Uh, That's a good thing. <laughs> I, think that <laughs> has public, a, anyway. I think that adds a little diversity to the uh, legislature. Absolutely, which is what we need. Yeah, my background is in communications. I have a bachelor's and master's in uh, communications, and I've uh, had a number of experiences, including uh, working on air here in Baton Rouge. That's right, Rouge. I remember what you're talking about. Yeah, and now uh, having my own uh, company, Sharon Broom Communications. And, and so uh, I, my background in communications has certainly helped me as a legislator, because as you can imagine, a lot of what we do down there is talk That's right. uh, and debate and communicate issues. So you it have is, to persuade. It, that's right. And persuade. be persuaded. <laughs> exactly. So it has served me well, my background in communication. And I think folks don't really uh, maybe necessarily always understand just because you're in the legislature doesn't mean that's your full-time job. Exactly. It's really a full-time job, but yeah. there's no pay like it's yeah. a full-time job. It, it, it is a full-time job in terms of uh, delivery, uh, but as it relates to salary, it's not. So you find that most legislators have other employment. Uh, for example, we have, of course, attorneys. Then we have a number of uh, insurance agents is way up there at the top. We have yeah, we have educators and we have people who have their own uh, businesses. We have people who are small contractors and we have people with large construction companies. Which is what the government is supposed to exactly. be, representative of the population, of the people. Exactly, representative democracy. So it, it's, it should look like the landscape of the state of Louisiana. Excellent, I love that. Let's, um, let's talk about uh, the fact that you have been in public service for a long time. Judge Guidry was just <laughs> was saying you are a true public servant. Well, I've, I've I feel that I have been enormously uh, blessed to have had a long stint, if you will, in uh, public service as an elected official and people electing me and re-elected me. I started my journey uh, back in 1988 when I ran for the Metro Council and served there three years and then came to the state legislature as a state representative in 1992, and I've been there ever since. Of course, this is my last term. I'm now in the Senate. And let's remind folks, the, the way our government works mm -hmm. is we're chopped up into the governor, into the, the legislature, and the judiciary. You're exactly. in the legislature, and you served three terms in the House. Correct. And you're going to finish three terms in the Senate. Yes. So you've been about everywhere you can be in the in the House, yes. in, the, in the people's right. place. And, and we do have term limits in the legislature. Um, our term limits compared to other states is somewhat generous in that 
you can serve 12 years in the House, 12 years in the uh, Senate, and if you choose, you can run back for the House of uh, Representatives. But I can tell you right now, <laughs> that's not happening. One thing <laughs> I know for sure is that I am not going to run for the House of Representatives when I leave uh, the Senate. Well, from what I understand, the the media reported that you you are contemplating perhaps running for mayor of, of Baton Rouge. That is certainly uh, a consideration that I, I'm giving uh, strong. Uh, prayer to and right. talking with uh, my family, my friends, and so that is one option because certainly the uh, when I become term limited, it's almost simultaneous to when the uh, mayor of Baton Rouge becomes uh, term limited. So we'll see. I, I have a lot of work to do still in the Senate. <laughs> I've got a lot of ideas about uh, accomplishments that I I want to pursue as a as a state senator as it relates to policy as it relates to uh, delivering constituent services uplifting my community so I, I'm a firm believer that if you uh, if you bloom where you're planted then doors will open up for you now that doesn't mean you you can't plan you know you have to you have to uh, the base, best laid yeah, plans though huh? exactly you, you, you have <laughs> to plan so I, I'm certainly giving uh, a lot of uh, prayerful consideration to my next step excellent well that's good news let's talk about the fact that y'all just wrapped up a legislative session uh, yes. we're supposed to be focused on fiscal issues yeah. explain to the folks this year is an odd number uh, year and so by the Constitution our our focus has to be on a uh, fiscal uh, issues and a fiscal session we can file Made of money yes dealing with money taxes spending, et cetera. What we're bringing in. And, and so we can uh, certainly we have the opportunity to do five non-fiscal related bills but it really helps us focus on the fiscal matters of the state of Louisiana. And as you know, we started out with uh, the governor proposing removing the uh, state, personal state uh, income tax. Right. And after he floated that out there for a while, it, it really didn't get a lot of traction. And it was so, gonna be get rid of the income tax, but create a sales tax exactly. for the state. Exactly, and so it, it didn't get a lot of traction. There was a lot of discussion around the state about it. And so the first day of session, uh, the governor decided to pull back on that. And so as it turned out, our discussions really focused a lot around the budget. Uh, because we've had a budget shortfall for now Forever, almost like. five uh, years. And what, what our budget this year is over a billion dollars again, isn't uh, yeah, it? Yeah, well, our budget this year is uh, $24 billion. Uh, I mean, it's a billion a, yeah, short, yeah, right? Yeah, so we started out over a billion short. So we had to address these uh, issues. And, of course, we have the budget shortfall fall for a number of reasons, because of a sluggish economy, because uh, we lost uh, the money that we were getting from the federal government as a result of Hurricane Katrina. Right. We had a lot uh, of, we had horrible damages and right. tragedy, but we got a lot of money exactly. from that, billions of dollars. Exactly, and so. Um, BP spill too. Yeah, and so there are other factors that have played into the reason why we've had that shortfall over the years. Uh, we so we had to address that right, and that was that was a big uh, challenge for us, of course. Because y'all cut cut a billion dollars, what at least around that every single every, year. Yeah, every so year. So there's we, not a whole lot of fat. Left. Every year we've uh, been faced for that, faced with that, and one of the other reasons is because we have not uh, received uh, money from the federal government as it relates to health care and so with a whole lot of different factors that have attributed to that shortfall. But uh, at the end of the day, after a lot of deliberation, a lot of negotiations between the Senate and the House, we came up with a uh, budget that minimized uh, uh, the impact on the elderly as it relates to health care that, uh, uh, that really helped our, our, uh, some of our universities, uh, helped public education. Many people were also concerned uh, about the scholarship or voucher program. Tops. What everybody calls TOPS. Well, in addition to that, TOPS uh, for higher ed, but as you know, we have 
have a uh, voucher program, right. a scholarship program here. So, Which is wonderful. So many people uh, were concerned about that money uh, staying in the budget. And, and, and so we, I feel that we uh, did a good job in co covering a lot of territory. All right, we'll continue this on the next segment. This is Legal Lines with Locke Meredith and our guest Sharon Broom. She is the president of the Senate Pro Tem. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Locke Meredith, and I'd like to thank you on behalf of myself, Sean Fagan, and Corey Ogeron, and our entire staff for letting us come into your homes for the last 10 years via Legal Lines. We hope that you've come to a greater understanding of how the law works and how the government works for you. So from all of us, thank you. Welcome back to Legal Lines. I'm Locke Meredith, and again, very pleased to have back on the show Sharon Broom. She is the Senate President Pro Tem for the Louisiana Senate. Sharon, again, let's just dive right back in, and thanks for being with us. Good conversation. Let's, uh, let's talk about, because the Senate was going to focus on fiscal issues, but you indicated there were five non-fiscal or money-related bills. Is that per legislator or? Yes, each legislator could and, file and, five non-fiscal related bills. And you bills. got three passed by the legislative yeah, body yeah. Uh, pending before uh, Governor Jindal at this point. Yeah. Let's talk about uh, the mental health court because that, okay. that is something I think is extraordinarily important. Yes, out of my legislative package, uh, I had three bills and, and more than that, but uh, I wanted to make sure that people were aware of these three bills that I believe are very uh, significant for our community and for our state. Uh, one of the bills is establishing and authorizing a mental health court throughout the court system in the state of Louisiana. So explain to the folks what that means. What is it going to do? Well, this particular bill, lock was um, evolved out of a discussion or a summit that I had earlier this year focusing on the roots of violence in our community. And, and let's again point out to folks that Louisiana has the largest percentage of its populations in jail, in prisons right now, than any population in the world. Absolutely, that is a statistic that we shouldn't be proud of, that we definitely need to continue to work on to offer some remedies. And, and one last thing, Sharon, because we've mm -hmm. talked about it, the reason it's so important, your bill, is because the recidivism rate, the rate that these, these folks come out of prison, they go back within three to five years, within 70, 80, 90 percent of those folks do that. Exactly. And so it's not working. It's right. And so this particular uh, bill uh, authorizing mental health courts deals with nonviolent offenders. And let's stress that nonviolent, non meaning there's offenders. no victim who's been beat up or killed or in any way physically harmed. Exactly. And so it really helps in a myriad of ways. First of all, it allows the offender to be put in a, a system, if you will, towards resources instead of incarceration. Uh, unfortunately, many uh, repeat uh, nonviolent offenders have mental health challenges and they are often put in jail and then it puts an extra financial burden, of course, on uh, the jail. The state. The state, Us, the exactly. Taxpayers. The state, uh, the taxpayers. And so if we put them towards the resources, it will cut that amount of money in half and offer assistance uh, to make a difference in terms of rehabilitation for the nonviolent offender. And to give people lock a an analogy, it would work similarly as drug courts right. operate. And, and Judge uh, Marabella has touted the, the, exactly. the wonderful benefits of that court. We have seen uh, enormous benefits. I've been to some of the graduations for the people who were involved in drug court. So they do work. And mental health courts will also work and as well. And let's point out, Sharon, that um, Number one, for those folks who don't care uh, about helping the individual, it's so vastly more cheaper, as you indicated, because two things. One, you're, you're, it's much cheaper, by over half at least, to put them through this, this mental health court and the system that's set in place there than the prison system. And hopefully they come out and they're not going back. 
exactly. into jail. Exactly. And the bill also provides for an accountability mechanism. And that's a big me deal. Mechanism. Exactly. That is very significant. They screw up. They're going They're, back on the other track into prison. Exactly. And so uh, I believe we this will be a an excellent remedy as we look at the whole landscape of violence uh, in our community. There are now at least, I believe, three mental health courts that are established throughout the state in Lafayette, uh, Lake Charles, and I believe there's one in New Orleans as well. And so when we did the legislation, there were a number of people who were certainly affirming the value of having a mental health uh, court. All the stakeholders involved, in, including the behavioral health community, law enforcement. The prison the, system. Yeah, the sheriffs. Everybody was involved in this discussion. And so everybody has signed on as it being a good remedy. Because it should be a no-brainer. Yes. I mean, it saves money and it helps people. So I don't know exactly. what else you want, want out of legislation. Exactly. So I'm very glad about that. Uh, and so now for folks, we want them to be aware of that and also encourage the, their, their representatives and government to go ahead and make sure that we have the funds allocated to implement that. Well, because this has been a, this is a challenging uh, fiscal environment for us, Locke, I had to be very cautious and not attribute a, a very high a fiscal note. So we've worked with the stakeholders involved to eliminate fiscal notes. Of course, it is now incumbent upon the judiciary to implement the legislation. It's up to them. It's not mandatory. The yeah. So they may want to readjust some of their budgets to accommodate this, but at least we have the framework in place and the authorization, uh, legal authorization in place to go forward with Excellent. the mental health court. Let's talk about another component of crime where uh, it's just a tragedy, and that is human trafficking. Tell the folks what you've, what you've done in that regard. Well, people are very uh, surprised around this whole discussion, or, or I guess I should say there's a level of awareness that is um, elevating surrounding human trafficking. Uh, the modern day form of slavery right. in various uh, types. Both labor and sex. It's it's not exactly. It's just sex. It's not just sex, it's labor and sex. And uh, the United States is becoming, it's a, a rising uh, criminal industry in the United States of America. Because we got folks here wanting that. Right. And then we got folks here providing that. Right. And so here in Louisiana, uh, we have been a state that has had human trafficking taking place, a lot because of our location, uh, a lot because of our interstate. Big old interstates going through here. And so this proximity to, proximity. to countries where people exactly. get kidnapped, exactly. but they get kidnapped here exactly. in good old U.S. of A. That's right. And uh, children are some of the uh, most common victims right. of human trafficking. So. Senate Bill 88 that I passed with a lot of stakeholders involved once again does two things. It provides a fund for victims of human trafficking to get restitution. And secondly, it has an integrated approach of uh, different departments to offer a response to victims of human trafficking primarily coming from the Department of Children and Family Services. So those resources and uh, the connection to those resources will be provided for those victims of human trafficking. And as I well. know uh, Lee Domain with Trafficking Hope is, is a big proponent of providing help and I know that he is thrilled that you have accomplished this. Certainly right? as a nonprofit organization, uh, a Trafficking Hope, uh, Lee's organization, he and his wife, has certainly been on the forefront of uh, awareness surrounding this, and not only awareness, but offering a response to Putting this Putting their issue. money where their mouth is. Exactly. They're, they're building some yes. place right now. Well, that's wonderful. We'll continue this on the next Legal Lines. This is Locke Meredith with our state president, Pro Tem, Sharon Broom. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Locke Meredith, and I'd like to thank you on behalf of myself, Sean Fagan, and Corey Ogeron, and our entire staff for letting us come into your homes for the last 10 years 
via legal lines. We hope that you've come to a greater understanding of how the law works and how the government works for you. So from all of us, thank you. Welcome back to Legal Lines. I'm Locke Meredith. Again, very pleased to have on the show again Sharon Broom. She is the Senate President Pro Tem and the Louisiana Senate. Sharon, thanks again for being on the show. It's been a good discussion. Let's do this. Uh, let's dive into your other non-fiscal bill. Okay. Um, which you're also very proud of because you, you mentioned to me uh, in private that you're getting a lot of calls because this yeah. is very difficult economic times. Uh, one of the uh, respond, one of the many of the calls that I get a lot have to do with people and their homes, various different issues. But a lot of people call me uh, right at the uh, verge or the brink of losing their home and asking me, "Is there anything that I can do?" And certainly, I, I have I don't have the resources, the financial resources to help them. So, I frequently received these calls and I thought after meeting and discussing it uh, with uh, some other folks in the housing industry, fair housing industry, uh, we came up with the Louisiana Home Protection Act. And basically, in a nutshell, this bill provides information for those people who who are receiving a sheriff's notice that their house is about to be uh, foreclosed, on. foreclosed on and, uh, and seized. There are many people who get these notices, and as soon as they get them, they freeze. Yeah, they they're, they're paralyzed, be out and they just huh? figure there's n there's nothing that they can do. And as you know, Locke, a person's home is their greatest asset, and so it's a win-win for the individual, the homeowner, and the community if we can keep people in their homes and the banks too. Their, and can't the banks get rid exactly. of them fast. I exactly, mean, they're holding hundreds of thousands of homes Correct. right now. Correct. So what this bill does is when a person receives that sheriff's notice, in that sheriff's notice is going to be additional information that will direct them towards housing counselors or someone if they uh, feel like they want to pursue maintaining and sustaining their home, someone that they can uh, connect with that will give them valuable information. So Good. it's really pointing them it's towards educating information, them. E educating them. So I'm very glad about it because it's, it's a significant consumer bill. And, it, and it's it's a frightening process to go through and you think, oh my gosh, you know, the world's coming to an end. Mm -hmm. and and. It, that doesn't happen. Exactly. It doesn't yes. have to happen that way. Well, let's let's shift gears a little bit too now. Um, we've talked about uh, briefly the fiscal stuff, but you know, crime is such a big deal in our society. We talked earlier about the fact that uh, you know, in Louisiana, we have the highest percentage of our population in jails than any country in the world, any region in the world. So, um, tell me what your your I guess not remedy, but what you're trying to do to help address it, because youth crime is so just devastating now. Well, I can certainly say that this is a concern that a number of my colleagues have, especially here in the Baton Rouge part of our delegation. I can think of many of our legislators, a number of them, who have taken on this this issue. It's a tragic. It, it, tragic it's a tragic. Thing. Sixteen uh, murders of of young people happen uh, almost daily in the in the United States of America. I think I read ten times ten higher times than, in, than in any other country, fully developed region. Yeah. So that's a that's a startling statistic. And as you know, Locke, because I know this is an issue that you're very passionate about as well, uh, we're, we're trying to come up with remedies to address uh, crime, especially as it relates to, to youth. Uh, the Children's Defense Fund often refers to this as the pipeline to prison that often happens with our, our young uh, males. Uh, in the community, and, and so I'm a, I believe that we can develop an equation or a formula that works. Uh, it starts with education. Boy, education is is, Boy, is, is is significant in this whole uh, in this whole discussion to turn around crime in our community. Sharon, let me let me read to you from the report. We've discussed this earlier, but. Uh, this was a, a, a report commissioned by the governor of Louisiana in March of, of 2010 
It was commissioned by the Louisiana governor, lieutenant governor, and the state legislature, and you, you're aware mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. And it provides this, it says that education is the strongest and most predictive determinant of health, socioeconomic, and criminal outcomes. Just one year increase in the average level of schooling in a community, just one year, is associated with a 30% decrease in overall murder rate. One year more schooling and you get a 30% reduction in murder. Amazing. It is. Tragic. And it certainly would seem to be solvable. This is something we can do something about. You would think it is something that we can do a uh, remedy and certainly there are individuals in our community who are working to make this happen. I think of our truancy program here in East Baton Rouge Parish. Yes, I know Hiller Moore, the DA, is passionate about it, as are all Very law passionate. enforcement folks. That's part of the equation. Education, truancy, uh, parental involvement. Big we issue. hear that all the time, the involvement of a, a parent in a child's life and in specifically in his or her education. And if it's there's not a parent, at least someone who loves that child or someone who's willing to pour into that child. That's why we have a number of mentoring programs in our, our, our city as well. People who are willing to volunteer and serve to reach out and respond to young people who may not have both parents in the home or who may need additional um, additional counseling or uh, additional encouragement. So there are a lot of different factors uh, that are involved, but it's, it's an issue lock that we are going to continue to have to chip away at, chisel away at, but even more importantly, we have to be committed right. as a community to resolving this Well, and this again, issue. morally, you know, you would hope that our society morally will want to deal with this, but totally independent of the moral component, there's an economic component. And Judge Gittery and I were discussing this earlier, that there's a study, in fact, this exact same governor's study, that says we spend $9,000 per child to send them through K through 12, okay? Or we can spend over $40,000 a year to keep them in prison. So just on economic terms, it's so vastly more economical to educate a child to keep, so you're not paying for the prison expense, plus they become a productive citizen of society and they, they have families and they provide jobs and they work and that's the way we're supposed to work. Exactly, there is certainly the moral response to assisting uh, young people and others in this whole equation. And as you just stated, there is the fiscal component. We can invest early up, that's another big discussion, is, is childhood, early childhood education. We can invest early in a child's life, make sure we are there to walk them through the journey of, uh, of their education and watch what happens on the end of this educational because journey. Because if we're not there leading the way, Someone, the bad guys are going to be That's there so leading true. the way. That's so true. So we definitely have to make this a priority in our community and, and make sure that we're, we're investing uh, our time and our resources to changing and turning this situation sure, around. Thank you. It's been wonderful to thank see you, you again. This is Lockbear with Legal Lines, Senate President Pro Tem, Sharon Broom. Thank you for being with us.